Well, good morning. Welcome to the second week of fall. Can you believe that? I was talking to one of the students this week, and she said, yeah, I know it's fall. We went from 94 to 91. <laughs> fall has hit, and actually it was quite beautiful this morning. Hey, if you have been worshiping with us in the house for a while, um, and you have seen folks walk around with those little name tags on that say New Hope, and you're going, how can I get one of those? Well, there is a table in the back where you can go and say, how can I get one of those? And they'll take care of that for you. So if you'd like to get one of those fancy New Hope name tags that are so helpful because, um, you know, through COVID and everything else, we've all been so disrupted. If you're joining us from home, we appreciate you being with us and look forward to the time when we're back in the same room. So if you would like to get one of those, just stop by there on the way out the door. One other thing to just mention, November 7th is coming up. What's going to happen on November 7th? Anybody know? Burn the mortgage, Burn the mortgage party. Yes, we're going to have that one service at 10 o'clock. Now, what's, what's neat about that is that that is also Time Change Sunday, right? So if you oversleep and go, okay, oh, I missed church. No, you didn't. If you undersleep and you go, oh no, I'm too early. No, you're not. It'll be at 10 o'clock right in between our two services. And then we'll go straight from there out onto the yard and we'll have a great big celebration. And in that celebration, there'll be bounce houses. There'll be stuff for all ages. If, if you're over 70 and want to get on the bounce house, you just have to sign a thing that says, I'm, I'm over 70 and I want to get on the bounce house. But... Um, called liability insurance but that's that's a whole nother story but if you would like to bring kids grandkids neighbors friends friends of friends people you don't even know it is a great chance to do that on november 7th we would love to see you come out one service at what time 10 o'clock uh there are lots of other things going on here at new hope this week and if you would turn your attention to the screens and then ben will offer us a prelude to get our hearts settled before the lord god bless you Good morning and welcome to New Hope. We're glad to have you here, whether you're in the room or worshiping online. Pastor Mike has been preaching through a series about life together. And if you're not already connected in a group outside of Sunday worship, I urge you to find a group on Wednesdays, a connect group. There's multiple options for all ages and stages of life. And you can find more by visiting our website or opening the camera on your phone if you're in the building go ahead and scan that qr code that you see on the seat on front of you or if you're online on the screen it's a wonderful way for you to continue giving to god's kingdom that way or if you're on campus and you'd like to drop off checks or cash you can go ahead and do so in those white boxes you'll see in the lobby the qr code is a wonderful way to find out all of the exciting options there are here at new hope as well as sign in on our friendship pad each and every week. We love you, we're grateful to have you worship with us, and we're excited to take communion with you today.
As we enter this time of worship, hear God's word from Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, it may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Please stand to sing our opening hymn.
Eternal Father, we praise your holy name. O oh God, let our humble worship bring you honor and glory this and every day. You alone, Lord, are holy and worthy to be praised. And we offer our worship to you in the strong and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we echo the heavens to sing your praise. Church, what do we believe? We believe in God the Father Almighty. We believe in Jesus Christ, His Son. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in life after death. We believe in our resurrection. gather as the people of God at home and here in the room, it is often easy to forget, to forget the things that are going on in our world, to forget the things that are weighing us down to a very real extent. And we can carry those burdens, or we can do as the Lord has asked us to do through the scripture, to cast our burdens at the foot of the cross, and in due season he will lift us up. Let us join our hearts together in prayer as we indeed cast our burden at the foot of his cross. Gracious God, we thank you and praise you that you are a sovereign God. Lord, that means that there is nowhere that we can go from your presence. That means there is nothing that catches you by surprise. You are the Alpha. You are the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. And so, Father, even though we get so wrapped up in very, very important, very, very serious, but very, very temporary things, would we place our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith? Would we run hard after you, Father? Would we, as the psalmist said, Allow deep to call unto deep unto the waterfall of your love. And yet, Father, you have placed us at this time in this place. And you have given us eyes to see, spiritual eyes that have been awakened to the reality of you. And physical eyes to see all of the needs that surround us. And so, Father, may we not grow weary in prayer. May we not grow weary in praying for brothers and sisters around the world, Father, who are suffering literally for your name's sake, Father. We think of our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. And while they may not be on the news and we may not be inundated with their, with their photos and, and with the videos and things like that, Father, their needs are real. They need you, Father, for their strength. They need your church to rise around them in prayer and in, when possible, in physical help. Father, we do pray for your saints around the world who are suffering from persecution, suffering persecution in ways that we cannot even imagine. And Father, we pray that as your church, as we have been so very, very blessed, that we would not take those blessings lightly or for, for granted and that we would not grow soft in our faith. Strengthen us, O Lord, strengthen us. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Haiti, 
on the Gulf Coast of our own nation. Father, we pray for brothers and sisters around the world, many of those that we don't even know what they're facing right now. And so, Father, we pray that you would bring them to our mind and bring them to our heart. Bless your missionaries, those who have gone to these places in your name, to bring your truth, to bring your hope. And Father, we pray that that hope would be an anchor for their soul, firm and secure, and likewise, that it would be an anchor for our soul as we see this world. Father, we pray for our children. Father, we pray for our children as they are in schools. And ask, Father, that you would give not only safety, not only physical safety and physical protection, but, Father, mental and spiritual protection as well. Father, may we not grow weary in this prayer. Father, we pray for those on our local school boards and and around the country, Father, even around the world as they make curriculum decisions, as they make social decisions, as they think through all of these things, Father. Would they recognize that our children are precious? And along that line, Father, we pray for the end of abortion in our country. Suffer the children to come unto me, you say. Yet, Father, our children are suffering. And so, Father, we pray for boldness. We pray for an Acts 429 boldness for our legislators, for our justices. And Father, we pray that as thousands gathered yesterday to to voice some sort of support for this evil, Father, I pray that we would, would rally around the throne, that we would constantly intercede for those not yet born. Father, remind us that all of our days were written before a single one came to pass. Remind us that you knit us together in our mother's womb. Father, remind us that life is precious. Father, we pray for our leaders. You tell us in 1 Timothy 2 to pray for those in power and authority over us so that our lives may be peaceable. And so, Father, we do lift them to you from our president, to our legislators, to our local police, mayors, elected officials and again for our school officials for others father that are making decisions and ask father if they're not asking you that you would impress upon them your will but even more father that they would come to know you and that they would be changed that you would live by your spirit in them that they may govern and lead according to your will according to your way and father we Expand that prayer to not just the United States, but even to the Taliban, Father. To those who are militantly against you, Father, you took Saul, who was out to kill your church, and by your spirit and by your salvation made him a missionary for your church. And so, Father, we ask that you would do it again. Do it again. Use us to spread your message, to spread your gospel. We trust you, we love you, we serve you. In the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.
me in prayer as we confess our sins to the Father. Let us pray. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your Son and bring to naught all he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known. For you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your holy church that we may sing your praise triumphantly. O comforter of Christless word, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. Let us continue to pray silently before the Father. Hear the good news of our assurance from God's holy word. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. seated. We worship God for who he is. We bless him for what he does. We thank him for his grace in our lives. We give as an expression of our thankfulness for the grace we have been shown in Christ Jesus. Today and throughout this week, we give our time, talents, and finances with joy and praise.
What a blessing to be led in worship so powerfully. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your extra time and talent and blessing us so mightily. We are truly, truly blessed. Well, we are finishing up today our series called Life Together. And if you remember, part of the thing that we're thinking about with Life Together is what it means to put off and put on. Put off and put on. In other words, there's ways that we approach life. There's ways that we approach relationships. There's ways that we approach money. There's ways that we approach essentially everything in life. And when Jesus comes into our life and makes that radical transformation, it changes everything. Jesus changes everything. And that's really what it's saying here in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, to the way that things were, to put off your old self and to put on the new self. Put on the new self. That's kind of cryptic. It's kind of, what, what do we do with that? And so we have been looking at several different characteristics of that over the past couple of weeks. Just sort of as a quick refresher, reminder, remember that application is everything. We can know about it. We can go to Home Depot and buy the paint, but until we actually put it on the wall, we haven't really done anything. We can have all the tools, but until we put them to work, it hasn't really taken off anything and put on anything new. Application is everything. James says it this way. He says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Application is everything. And then last week, we saw that accountability counts. Accountability counts. And especially in the way that our world has been so disrupted, our, our social circles have been disrupted by COVID for the past 22 months. Our family circles, in many cases, have been so disruptive. Our regular routines have been so disrupted over the last 22 months. But that does not change Hebrews 10, 24, which tells us not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, encouraging one another. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. There's not even a Tonto. It didn't work last week either. Y'all remember that, right? right? There are no Lone Ranger Christians. God gave us each other. He gave us a family. He did not leave us here orphaned. He gave us His Spirit, which draws us together. And so, accountability counts. Well, this morning we're going to see the final part of putting off and putting on, at least for this series, at least in this thinking. Now, this is out of the, the, the book of John. And it's John chapter 17. Some people say that the Lord's prayer is our Father which art in heaven, which is true. This is the prayer of the Lord. Okay? John 17 is actually said in the upper room. We're celebrating communion today. It's very appropriate that we think about what Jesus was saying when he was with his disciples in the upper room before they went to the garden where ultimately the guards came, arrested Jesus, and he died for our sins. This is, this is what was going on in the room when Jesus is praying for his closest disciples. But then we see by the end of the chapter that it also includes us because he says, I'm not only praying for them, I'm praying for those who would believe on their message. And that's us. Jesus is praying for us in John chapter 17. And there's so much going on in this chapter that we won't get to the entire thing. But I want to just step in and kind of eavesdrop, listen in for just a minute to see what was heavy on Jesus' heart as he prayed for us. Mission is a must. Mission is a must. In John 17, Jesus is praying for us and he says, as you sent me into the world, Lord, as you sent me into the world, I send them into the world. Let's just kind of catch this in context. We're going we're to look at John 17, 13 to 20. If you're following along at home or in your Bible, you might want to open it there. We'll have it up here on the screen. But let's see what Jesus is praying for us here. Jesus says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they, they, the apostles, the ones who were there, and ultimately us, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, 
and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be totally sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, you're probably sitting there and going, how can you say that mission is a must? I didn't even see the word mission in that entire passage. Ah, It's because you didn't do the research that I did. (laughs) Two different times in this passage, Jesus uses the word mission. But it's the Greek word. It's the word missio. Missio, sent. As you have sent me, so I send them. Missio means to be sent. If you've ever been to D.C., I used to live there years ago, and it was always fun to go down Massachusetts Avenue. Anybody ever been to Massachusetts Avenue? You drive down Massachusetts Avenue, and there are some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful buildings and homes there. But they're all missions. You know that? It's called Embassy Row. Because everywhere you look as you're driving down Mass Avenue, there's another flag. There's the flag of Ecuador. That's the mission of Ecuador. There's the flag of Brazil. That's the the mission of Brazil. There's the flag of Greece, and there's the flag of Germany, and all of these missions are on Embassy Row. Did you catch that? They're missions. They are filled with missionaries, ambassadors who have come from their home country to live in a different place so that people can see what their home country is really like. They are there as ambassadors, as missionaries. They are there on mission. Their place that they live there is called the mission. You see, they have been sent from home for a specific purpose, for a specific time, to represent a specific interest. As you sent me into the world, I now send them into the world. You see, we, we, we think of missionaries as folks who leave here and go to Africa somewhere, and those are definitely missionaries. We think of missionaries as those who, who go somewhere different. They leave home and they, 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 they're missionaries, for goodness sake. Anyone who follows Jesus is a missionary. Because as he was sent, so he sends us. Mission is a must. Look at what he says in Matthew 28. He says, Then Jesus came to them. This is after he has been resurrected. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and what? Make disciples, followers, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. You see, to be on mission is simply to be sent. To be sent. In John 1, 14, Jesus, the the author of John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us who Jesus is. He says, the Word became flesh, Jesus himself, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. See, that that ambassador, that missionary who is sent from another country, they come full of commission. They come from Peru to tell you what Peru is like, to represent Peru, but they don't necessarily come full of truth. You see, that's the difference. Jesus Christ sends us out not only full, but full of grace and full of truth. Because you see... (laughs) Jesus came to bring grace and truth for a reason. Why did Jesus come? First John puts it very, very clearly. 
The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Did you know that's why he came? He came to crush Satan's work. What is Satan's work? Death. Death is Satan's work. Has been from the beginning. Look at Genesis chapter 3. What happened when Adam and Eve fell? When Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? They were separated from God. And yet Jesus came to destroy that work. Maybe, maybe you're used to it more in a different way. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, death has been swallowed up in victory. What was the victory? Jesus Christ on the cross for you and for me. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. That's what separates us from God. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody's got to say amen. I mean, this is great news. This is phenomenal news. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. We are on mission. As followers of Jesus, we are on mission. And the mission is a mandate. You see, Jesus came to destroy the power of sin and death. He was sent to save. He says, I sanctified myself. I set myself apart for a special purpose that we may be truly sanctified as well. You see, people have a problem with that, don't they? Haven't you experienced this? I, somebody says, you know, I really like the message of Christianity. I really like the Bible and all that stuff. You know, love one another. All that. That's really fun. But do you have to convince me that it's true? I mean, can't you just let me alone? Do you have to try to convert me all the time? I mean, come on. Dan, don't you know the Beatles song, Let It Be? Come on, man, just let it be. Why are you always trying to save me? Why are you always trying to convert me? Let me ask you this. Listen, if you saw someone that you knew and someone that you loved, someone that you had a relationship and someone that you loved dearly and they were sick, and you had been through the same sickness, and you had had a treatment that had changed everything, if you truly loved them, would you let them continue in their sickness. You see, if you, if you truly had that relationship with them, if you truly wanted to see them have just whatever you had, is it loving to step in and say, go to my doctor. Take this treatment. See what a difference it's made for me. And, the, and, and listen, the more they push against that and the more you love them, the more you want to step into their life and say, listen, listen, I love you so much, I'm not going to allow you to do that. I love you too much to let you keep going down that road. It's not going anywhere good. And the more you love them and the more you step into them, the more on mission you are with them. Do you see that? God has sent us on mission into their life. And it may look like it's terribly intense. But you know what? That kind of love is terribly intense. If you've ever been to Hawaii, they've got these blowholes. You know what I'm talking about? You're standing next to the ocean and, and there's these little underground caves and every time a wave comes in, all of the power of that wave is pushed through this little tiny hole and if you're standing there, you can get blown away by those blowholes. Anybody ever been there? You know what I'm talking about? It's the same amount of pressure all the way up and down the coast. It's just that it's very concentrated right there. And sometimes our love for someone and the power of the truth is so concentrated that it seems like it's totally intense. Because it is. Because God's love for them through your witness is that intense. Because God loves them that much. 
You see, sometimes we forget that Jesus came to pay for the penalty of our sin. When he died on the cross, he paid the penalty of our sin. That's called atonement. But he also gave us the power over our sin. That's called sanctification. And one day he will even deliver us from the presence of sin. That's called heaven. But there's no more tears, no more crying, no more sickness, no more sorrow. That's what Jesus has done for us. Jesus came to make broken people whole and to make sinful people holy. You see, those that say, can you just kind of hold on to it yourself? Do, do, do you have to be trying to convince me that I need what you have? They don't understand that Jesus was not just sent to show who God was, but he was sent to save us. And we have a dynamic of truth and love. We have a dynamic of both love and truth. And see, God has placed you in the lives of people. He has placed relationships around you. You don't have to go somewhere else. You may be called to go somewhere else on mission, but you're on mission today. You're on mission wherever you are because as the Father sent Jesus, so he sends us, so he sends you, so he sends me. You see, if we love them but we don't know that, that there's any truth, there's no mission. We can love someone, but if we don't know that there's truth, we don't really have a mission for them, do we? But if we know the truth, but you don't care, there's no mission either there. But see, when love and truth go together, you're on mission. You're on mission. You know the, the, the opposite of love? What's the opposite of love? The opposite of love is not hate. Hate is an emotion. There are forces that hate us because we love Jesus, and they are working radically against us because they hate. You know, the opposite of love is apathy. The opposite of love is to say, I don't really care what happens to you. I don't really care as long as I'm okay, I'm fine. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. But because we love with truth, we cannot avoid being on mission. Now, there are those that say, that's all well and good, Pastor. Thank you, Mike. But you just need to know that I, I was raised, I believe that my faith is a private thing. What's between me and God is between me and God. Let me ask you a question. If I were to, um, well, it's football season. My son's at Clemson. I'm not necessarily a Clemson Tiger fan, but I will be for a moment. If I were to put on the Clemson hat that he sent me that's very gaudy purple with orange on the front, right? And a Clemson shirt, right, that says, go Tigers, and purple sweatpants, because apparently that's what you wear. And then I even got purple and orange shoes to go with that, okay? Every one of those decisions to put on all of those things are very, very personal, are they not? Nobody is making me put on the hat. Nobody is making me put on the shirt. Nobody's making me put on the shoes or the pants, right? It's a very, very personal decision. But as soon as I step into my neighborhood, guess what? I'm saying something, aren't I? I'm saying something that nobody can deny. The guy has terrible taste in clothes. No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I'm saying is I support Clemson. I'm a Clemson fan. Anybody can just look at me coming and going and going, purple and orange, that must be Clemson. You see, the decision to dress that way was a very personal decision. The decision to step out into the world like that makes it a very public, very public decision. People who say, I can just keep my faith private, I can just keep that between me and God, don't understand what faith is. They don't understand what mission is. They don't understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and not just a believer. You were taught with regard to your old ways to take off the old 
and to put on the new. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it is not a private thing. It is a very personal thing with a very public output to follow Jesus and to be on mission. You see, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send them. As I, so they. As I, so they. Mission is a must. Now, real quickly, we want to look at three features of what this mission is all about. We want to look at the result of our mission. We want to look at the power for that mission. And we want to look at the profoundness. Isn't that a great word? The profoundness of living on this kind of mission together. The result of mission is always joy. Did you know that? Look at what he says. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my what? Joy within them. Jesus articulates his message through this. He says, I've completed the work you gave me. I've revealed your name, and now I am coming to you so that their joy might be full. You know, there is a direct correlation between joy and sentness, isn't there? There is a direct correlation between purpose, mission, stepping out into the world, and joy. My brother-in-law retired, and many of you are retired military. Thank you so much for your service. I remember talking to my brother-in-law, Mike. He retired after 20-some-odd years in the Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel. And um, I said, Mike, what do you miss most about being in the Air Force, being in the military? And he said, a sense of mission. Knowing that everybody is going the same direction, trying to accomplish the same thing. He said it took him seven or eight years after his military service to kind of discover that mission in the private sector. He said it seems like everybody is just sort of going after their own thing and there's no sense of mission. There's no sense of going after something together. You see, we can fall into that so simply, can't we? We can fall into that in a way that just makes no sense at all. Because you see, Jesus Christ gave us His mission. He said, as I have been sent, so I send you. But so many times we buy into a different mission, don't we? Because we're inundated day after day after day, somewhere along the, the 1920s and 30s. All of a sudden, we kind of threw out truth, didn't we, as a, as, a, as a nation, as a culture, as a world? And all of a sudden, truth became whatever was true for you. And all of a sudden, all of those things that we were pulling together for, justice and peace and harmony, all of a sudden, those things became relative. Well, justice for you is not justice for me. Peace for you is not peace for me. And pretty soon, guess what happened? We became me's. Meism rose to the top. Jesus came and he broke all of that because you see, because we put ourselves in God's place, God put Jesus in our place. We deserve the cross. He went to the cross. Because we substitute ourselves for him, he substituted himself for us. We could not die the perfect death because we are sinful. Because he took on ourselves the things that only God deserves. He has taken on Himself the thing that we deserve. Jesus literally came to die to take on our punishment. That's the atonement. And He did it joyfully. Hebrews 12, 2 says it this way, for the joy set before Him, for the joy set before him. Not the happiness. There's a big difference between happiness and joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There is a direct reflection between mission and joy. There is a direct reflection between living in sentness and joy. Jesus said this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. Are you lacking joy today? Are you looking over your spiritual life, over your Christian life, and saying, what happened? Maybe you've fallen for the me-firstism that's so prevalent around us. Because you see, there's a direct correlation between joy and sentiment. There was a guy, his name was Michael Foucault. Michael Foucault um, was a social scientist, a philosopher, a pagan, um, whatever you want to call him. But he understood one thing about us. As he looked around our world, and he was a major part of this kind of thinking, it's called deconstructionism. As he looked around, he said, the more we are focused on our own self, the less joy we seem to have. Let me give you this quote. By exaggerating my significance, I lose my significance. I no longer count. I no longer make a dent. I no longer make an impact. By raising my needs to their highest level, more important than any other commitment or cause or transcendent or eternal truth, I no longer have anything to sacrifice for. I no longer have any cause that I'm a part of. I no longer have anything that I'm willing to sacrifice for. As a culture, when we bought into my needs first, we may have gained our freedom, but we lost our joy. Where's your joy? Is it wrapped up in how God is using you to tell others, to serve others, to love others? Jesus said, if I was sent, so I send them. So the product of mission is a joy. And the power for mission is an encounter with God. Jesus says, as you sent me, so I send them. Let me just real quickly hit this. You see, God never pulls you in without sending you out. Isaiah chapter 6, you remember that? Isaiah went to church one day and something happened that he did not expect. He saw God. Has that ever happened to you? I was just going to church and, whoa, I saw God. Amazing. That's awesome. And when he did, he was taken apart. Isaiah 6 says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. And what was his response? Coward. He was afraid. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And even then, the angel took the coal the sacrifice, and touched his lips. And then God said, who shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am. Send me. And God did. Church, here we are. Send us. Lord, here I am. Send me. Or what about Abraham? God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I've chosen you. And he's like, cool, I like this. I'm going to give you everything that you need and I'm going to give you a lot of things even that you want. And Abraham's like, man, this is great. Isn't that the kind of religion we all want? I mean, God comes along and he says, it's yours. You just won the spiritual lottery. How about that? But even before the end of that verse in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and he said, and all the peoples will be blessed on earth because of you, through you. God never blesses us without without his desire for us to be a blessing. God never brings us in to just hold on to us. He always sends us out. So I have a challenge for you right now. Unless you know today that you're making yourself vulnerable in order to be a blessing to other people, you're not living sent. Are you vulnerable in your time, in your energy, in your resources? Are you vulnerable in your story, in your heart? Are you connecting with people who need to know the truth? Are you living as one sent in their lives? 
Philippians 2 says it this way, in your, surrounding, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even obedient unto death. And so I want to ask you, are you willing to make, to say a very brief, but a very profound prayer today? Are you willing to accept the mission that as the Father sent Him, so He sends you. So He sends me. So He sends us. As the Father is sent, so I send you. If so, would you pray this prayer? Heavenly Father, send me. Send me. Send me wherever you would have me to go. Send me into those relationship circles that I know. Send me into those places that I'm fearful of because they don't talk like me. They don't look like me. They don't sound like me. They probably don't think like me. But you have opened the door. Colossians 4.4 4 says it this way, make the most of every opportunity to proclaim the gospel. Heavenly Father, send me. Not in my own power. Send me in the power of your Holy Spirit, not in my own message. Send me in the truth of your message. But God, give me boldness. Because just as you have sent the Father, just as the Father has sent you, you are sending me. Now the thing about all of this is that what is so amazing is that he has already provided the way. He has already paved the way for us to follow. We're not blazing trails. He, by His Spirit and by His power, is already working on those people that He has brought into your relationship circles. If we will trust. If we will say, you know what, Father? I am dressed in Your righteousness. I am wearing my crown that You have given to me. Would you let that be seen by those around me? Because they need this truth. They need this hope. They need this anchor for their soul in these troubled times. Jesus Christ, you have done everything. Everything necessary. You have defeated the works of the evil one. Now let me step into their lives in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, he reminds us, he gives us this physical reminder that what he has done is enough. What he has done, he has already accomplished for all who would put their trust in his name. Because see, Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, the word become flesh and dwelling among us, full of grace and full of truth. This is my body, and I give it willingly, even joyfully for the joy set before me. I give it for you. My body, which was broken, for you, that you might be made whole, that you might be healed. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, my blood is precious. This is a new covenant. Earlier he had said, a new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is the blood of a new promise, a new covenant 
This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says, do this every time you will, but do it to remember what I have done for you. My body broken, my blood shed, that you might have life. This is a table, not of New Hope Presbyterian Church. It's not even a Presbyterian table. This is a Christian table for anyone who has put their trust in Jesus Christ. If you have come to the point where you said, Jesus, you are my Lord. Yes, Jesus, you have forgiven me. Thank you for your forgiveness. My hope is in you. This table is for you. Take, eat, drink, enjoy. But if you have not yet made that step, we would ask that you would not partake of this table today. Not only out of honor for those of us who have put our faith in Him, but also, as Scripture says so clearly, to take this out of faith in Him is to drink and eat damnation upon yourself. And so if you are still figuring this out, if you're still saying, I'm not sure, please don't participate today. But if you have, even if you're struggling in it, if you have, allow this to remind you that His body was broken for you and His blood was shed for your forgiveness. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you and praise you for your love for us, a love that has been shown to us because you came. You lived among us. You were full of grace and you were full of truth and you did not leave us where we were. You loved us so much that you entered in. And so, Father, as you have sent Christ, would we realize that Christ has sent us. Give us boldness, give us grace, give us mercy, give us opportunity, even as you have given us your spirit and given us this physical reminder of a spiritual grace. And so, Father, set these things aside, this, this little wafer and this little tiny juice. Father, set it aside from its daily use. Use it for spiritual reminder of all that you have done for us. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and I don't think it was in a little plastic thing. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will, and you proclaim my death until I return. Amen. In the scriptures, it says that they sang a hymn before they left the room. So if you would, let's stand together and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. now receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. And may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen and amen. Amen.